Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and enjoy what you have heard, or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel grow, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person the next day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Camping Horror Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Before I read the first story, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Also, side note, because I keep getting asked, my voice is not AI. I am a real person. You can catch me on my live sometimes, and you will see it is me using my voice with no filter. Please feel free to ask any one of my subscribers or members of the channel. They will let you know. I am not an AI voice, <laughs> just a warm-blooded human being reading stories to adults. As flattering as it sounds, I prefer to narrate my stories the old-fashioned way, <laughs> coming from a human. So, <laughs> I hope that now puts your mind at ease. Let's get started with these stories, shall we? Hey y'all, this took place in the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down the story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make campfires and chill in secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last-minute hang to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's easily nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears, though, because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that, and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and a forest. So... One particular night at around 11 p.m., I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get here. The spot I get to has a two-minute paved walkway. I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway is two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge, the ramp down to the campfire spot as well. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit, etc. I get to the spot, and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during the hot summers. So I set up the chair, and I get to digging the pits with only my flashlight illuminating where I am digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash, a splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two-hand-sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water, even though I'm only a few feet away from it. I shine my flashlight at the water, and I don't see anything, so I kind of just brush it off, thinking I'm just hearing things. But as I keep shoveling a little bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above because logically, something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above where some trees are above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make a splash. So, as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. 
I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out, Hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately. But there was no bear, or signs of anything, for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now, because I've seen horror movies before. And now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So I shine my flashlight over to the area again. And as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress. Because honestly, of all the things I was to see... I didn't think I'd see a naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be about mid-forties, shaved bald head, and medium-ish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start picking up all my crap and getting the hell out of there. Because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So, after using my reflexive, deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me and briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in Crocs, mind you, so I'm hoping that if I had to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point and I get a sense of relief that starts setting in, knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But, as I check behind me for the final time, I do see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he was a primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet and positions his body to face me. After setting himself into this new position, the man starts running towards me. I freaking book it. I ran as hard as I can down that path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it, but I didn't care because a whole naked ass man was chasing me at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of the situation alive. I finally made it out of the forest, and I run to my car, which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car, and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my door. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, that's it, I'm actually dead. But I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly unlock my doors, and throw my things into the back seat before getting into my own car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I am fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was still coming. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me, and I zoom the hell out of that area as fast as I could. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends calling me asking if I made it to the spot yet, 
and all I say to them is, guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because, again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I told them the whole story the way that I told it just now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that. And I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out. But as we're just talking out in the front of the house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going toward the direction of where I just encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful. There's a naked guy that came chasing me by that bridge that crosses over the river. He responds saying, Oh, damn, really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. All that I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to go see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously. But the officer said they would make note of it anyways in case it happens again. Some friends say it's a skinwalker. Others say more realistically it's either a homeless or mentally ill or a drunk slash high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on past version of me. Because honestly, if, and I do mean when, time travel is real, I would totally screw with my younger self just like that. So, that is the only crazy camping story I have, but damn, it is a story I will never, ever forget. I've told this story probably over a hundred times, and despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate that makes for a great story, so I figured I'll share it with you here, now. I should start by saying that I always hated going camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every single year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilet, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, however, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but we were given considerable leeway and what we were allowed to do. Most nights, we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip was a time where the counselors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I didn't know, however, was that the events of that camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods ever again. The trip began as any other. Altogether, there were around 30 people on the trip. Four counselors in training, four counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 to 14. Walking in a single file line up and down the various trails, you would hardly hear any sounds of nature over the conversations and laughter of the campers. Several hours went by, and we made our way through a dense, marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training, Jordan, as well as two campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers, until the last of them faded just out of view around a bend about 50 feet up the way. 
Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace. But after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire, and the other half appeared to have been killed by disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated by a small, derelict cabin sitting in the middle of the scorched forest, but seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through this area. We were so enraptured by the scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned to look at where the sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us was a haggard-looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a long black beard slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked directly on us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him, and we had no idea how long he had been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's speed up and get back with the rest of the group, please. As we turned to continue on our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. The man muttered again slightly louder, Are you going camping? Jordan answered the man, Yes, we are going camping, to which the man smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Better be careful. We nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on to try and find the rest of the group, this time with a much easier and faster pace. Although the man had been walking up the small trail as us when we saw him, he didn't continue, but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail watching us as we made our way up the winding path and disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up with the rest of the group who had been waiting for us, and we told the adult counselors about our interaction with the man. They just shrugged it off, telling us that the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we were doing near his property. Still, I felt unnerved by the entire encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that that man had somehow followed us. Eventually, though, I put it out of my mind and managed to enjoy myself a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed, and Jordan and the other counselor in training from the boys' cabin had brought two warm Mike's hardies that they had stolen from the counselor's quarters, and I took out a joint. I had it stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint, and we made our way to the edge of the river, where we had washed our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and the thought of the man from earlier kept popping into my head. Assuming that I was cold, not anxious, Jordan gave me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night so I could get some sleep in the same tent with him and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this and after smoking the joint, we made our way back to our tents, which were pitched slightly away from the others and we discreetly sipped on the mics harder while telling scary camping stories. Some time passed, and one of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly making up on the spot, when he suddenly stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles. About 40 feet away, near one of the other campers' tents, 
as we strained to listen to what was going on. The noises stopped, and even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom, being stoned and hopped up from the scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide in our tent. Jordan followed suit, and we awkwardly made out before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sounds of footsteps walking around our tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quiet my breathing. From the sound, it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of our tent, seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan, but I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one I had been hearing, I closed my eyes and I was just beginning to drift back to sleep when I heard the tent unzip. I felt Jordan lie down next to me, and after a few moments, he put his arms around me and began to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realized I had to go to the bathroom and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie up over his head, before going still again. Quietly, so as not to wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement. Comforting myself that Jordan had just gone pee and was fine, I put my shoes on and began making the trek across the campsite to the designated pee zone. I had just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite, as if someone was rummaging through our supplies and bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull my pants up, and in my haste, I lost my balance and tried to catch myself with a branch that made a loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes and the light was getting bigger, so whoever it was, they were coming toward me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got ten feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, Sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but... I, I think one of the campers might have stolen it from my bag while I was sleeping or something. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out. Uh, but, um, but you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. What he said next made my blood run gold. What are you talking about? He said. It's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if I had left it by accident, but after I couldn't find it, I thought I'd check the boys' bags, and that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror, as I realized that the man who got into the tent with me just moments prior had not been Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what had happened and I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out himself. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent, and when Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow lying still inside of our tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur, 
while we ran to the pod of tents on the other side of the campground, where the older counselors were sleeping, and frantically unzipped their tent and started yelling for them to come out, and that there was a man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselors slowly and groggily woke up. But after a bit more of frantic yelling, they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation when a commotion broke out on the other side of the camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of other things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, we heard the counselors radioing back down to the camp to call the police, and we could tell that they were just as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept that night. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up, and by that time, a few of the other counselors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, one of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path, like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want the hoodie back, and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy that we ran into earlier on the trail, but his face and that night still haunt me to this day. So, to preface, I would like to state that this story is probably going to read like the plot of a campy 1980s horror movie, and is going to be very long. However, this entire story is true. If not for being five miles from cell reception and the way the story ends, there would be a police report for verification. I will be changing names and locations and some details in order to protect the privacy of the innocent. A buddy of mine and I try to camp twice a month now that I have a vehicle that can be trusted to get me to some of the more remote areas of our state. We planned a camping trip for this past weekend, February 18th through February 20th. We chose a fairly remote location we had been to the previous weekend. The previous weekend, we were the only ones we'd seen within a mile of our camp spot. Friday night, we got there and sat up. This story takes place Saturday night. It's about 9 p.m., so the sun has long gone down and the moon hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out, other than what our campfire lights up. Suddenly, we hear a man screaming. We listen intently, silently, sharing an anxious look. At first, we were hoping it was someone drunk and having a little too much fun. But it quickly becomes obvious that this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. It sounds full of despair, anger, and anguish. I'm going to take a moment to remind you that this is at 9 p.m., pitch black night, in the middle of nowhere woods, five miles from the nearest cell phone signal. We hadn't seen anyone in hours. The screaming continues for what felt like hours, but was probably about five solid minutes. We had no idea what to make of it and started feeling extremely paranoid. We gathered up anything remotely close to a weapon and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about 15 tense minutes of fear-induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and lantern slowly enter our camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic, How's it going? before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly, but flatly, by asking if we could do him a favor. Uh, <laughs> that depends on the favor, brother, my buddy and I said in unison. Obviously tense, 
holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out for a second by the fire, given the two of us and one of him, plus our myriad of weapons gathered from around camp, two within arm's reach. We decided to agree and let him hang out. After a short second of awkward silence, I ask him what the hell is going on. He proceeds to tell me and my buddy that he was camping down the trail with his buddy and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said, before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire and begins his story. We were just hanging out, man. We came up earlier today and my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming and just wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me. He lunged at me and I told him to just back off and chill, you know? Well, he kept coming after me and it started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure he was going to kill me. So I grabbed my car keys, the lights and ran. I don't know what to do, man. He chased me when I ran, and I don't know what to do. We don't have firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I look at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then something horrible dawned on me. Uh, wait, he chased you? Like, he's on his way here? Right now? The man just slowly nods in reply, and right on cue, like some terrible horror movie come to life, we hear screaming from maybe 30 to 40 feet away from our camp, down on the main trail. I just want your fucking balance. Gary, I want your balance. Gary. Gary, where are you? Where are you, Gary? I'd never in my life heard a man scream like this. I've never heard anything like it in my life. It was a brutal, guttural scream that was shrill to the ears, yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone gone completely mad, and the way he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing-songy to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent, and listened. By some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail, screaming the entire way. We ended up chatting with who we'll call Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further. Come to find out, they had taken four and a half to five grams of magic mushrooms each, and his buddy, who we'll just call Ty, was a co-worker of his and was fine for three and a half hours, then suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Ty thought he would kill Gary and steal his good trip. We heard the streams get further and further for over two hours, by this time, it's 11 p.m. The moon is starting to come out, and it's below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Ty had no jacket or flashlight, according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service. As it was snowy and icy and required two to three miles of highway driving, after getting off the trail, and Gary was still lightly feeling the effects, of weed and mushrooms, so he couldn't drive either. We had to make a decision to let the guy wander, hope he sobered up, and could find his way back. And he did. Oh, he did. Right into our camp. We hear yelling after about an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet from camp again. Hey, hey, help me. Please help me, I'm lost. And we can tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case and greet the man with me carrying my 12-gauge shotgun and my 40 cal pistol holstered. 
My buddy carrying his AK-47 style rifle and his 29 millimeter Glocks holstered. And with our flashlights on our brightest settings right in his face. He was about 6'2 or 6'3 and approximately 300 pounds. We talked to him, decided he was calm enough to walk with, and walked him back to his camp. He seemed really remorseful, said he blacked out and didn't remember anything, and had a falling out with his buddy. We escorted him back to camp, down the trail, returned and told Gary that Ty seemed cool, and if anything else happened, to scream and we'd come running. We would come out and help him out. It ended up being a happy ending. We made friends with Gary and I got his phone number to make sure the next day he got back into town safely. Back to his wife and kid. And we're actually planning a camping trip with him soon. Oh, but Ty, who wandered screaming like a deranged maniac in the forest, potentially building a hatchet to murder your friend to steal his good trip or whatever it is your psychosis-filled mind was thinking. For the love of God, let's not ever meet again. I was telling this story for a friend of mine. It was the beginning of summer. My DHJ and I were going camping at my favorite place in the whole world. This was a wilderness campground with a crystal clear lake and hiking trails, a river for canoeing, fishing, etc. This was going to be a special weekend where we leave the kids, careers, and all behind for just some time for the two of us in nature. It was a Saturday morning and Jay had to work, so it was a little while before he could leave. We got to the place we were going, and there was only the two of us. So we set up our tent and all that and done some hiking, had a picnic at the waterfall, etc., etc. Later on, we come back to camp, built a fire, and shared a bottle of wine till the darkness and fireflies set in. It was a full moon and everything was beautiful. I got this brilliant idea to do something I have done many times before. I wanted to go skinny dipping in the lake. Well, Jay had already drank too much and he was really tired from having to work earlier that day and all the hiking, so he didn't want to go. Also, there was no one camping except the two of us. If there had been, I would have gone at least not skinny dipping because I felt grimy and sweaty and just was not able to sleep without cleaning up. So, Jay decides to lie down and rest in the tent and I take off down the moonlit trail. My beach bag loaded with biodegradable soap and shampoo, change of clothes and other bath items. While walking down to the lake, my Spidey senses kind of picked up on something. Just a bad feeling. But I ignored it. So once I got there, I undressed, put my clothes on the root of a big old pine tree, and dove right on in. I bathed, swam, enjoyed the relaxation. It was almost like a trip to the spa for me. Finally, I got out. I was standing on the shore getting dressed and I had that funny little gnawing feeling like when you are being watched. My concern was not a person this time of year and we had not seen a soul all day and no one lived close by. My concern was that there could be a bear or some other wild animal. Just to describe the lake, the lake kind of sits like in a bowl. There is a cliff, but it's not a steep cliff. It slopes. There are trees and forests surrounding it. This is relevant, I promise. So, while getting dressed, I looked up towards the cliff, and my heart felt like it was about to stop. A person stepped out of the shadows of the trees. Just from his silhouette, I couldn't see his face. I thought it was Jay. 
Maybe he changed his mind about swimming, which was unlikely since when he goes to sleep, he sleeps like a log. Or maybe he was worried about me. I had been enjoying the lake so much, I'd been there probably about an hour, if not more. So, just assuming it was him, I first started joking with him. Sorry, but you missed a great swim. <laughs> or some dumb shit like that. Normally, he would joke back with me or say something grumpy if he was irritated that I had been down there too long, but he didn't say anything. All the while, I'm pulling on my clothes, still talking to him, but he never said a word. When I had all of my clothes on and was ready to start walking back, he stepped back into the shadows of the forest. At that point, I was pretty sure it was not Jay. So I grabbed my stuff and ran down the trail as fast as I could. One time, I thought I heard voices, but I was so scared I may have imagined it. I got back and Jay, of course, was sound asleep. I was ready to pack up and go home and thoroughly creeped out about being watched like that. But I could not get him to get up. I didn't sleep until he got up the next morning to make coffee. Every noise I heard during the night, I thought it was whoever that guy was that watched me. Jay was very upset and scared for me when I told him what had happened, and we hiked to the place where I saw the guy standing. There were two sets of footprints there, from what we could tell. That was one of the scariest experiences I have ever had. I think about how vulnerable I was in the lake that night and still just creeped out about someone watching me swim and then watching me get dressed. Anyway, creepy stranger or strangers, let's not meet again. To this day, we have no idea who that person or persons was, but I will never take a moonlight swim alone again. Growing up, every summer in July or August, my family would get together and camp out for two weeks at White Lake State Park in Tomworth, New Hampshire. Some of my best childhood memories were made there. Rollerblading, Nerf gun wars, flashlight tag, and water balloon fights with my cousins and neighboring kids in the campground. When I was around my late teen years, my family stopped gathering together to camp out after my grandmother passed away. One of the last years I was there, this one particular memory has always stuck with me. A little over 10 years ago, I was 16 years old. It was around 10 p.m. at night when I noticed I had a missed call on my cheapy little track phone. My family was sitting around the campfire cooking s'mores and sharing some laughs. So I decided to go off for some privacy to return the call. I took a long, narrow trail that winds in between other campsites that, at the end, leads up to the bathroom. I wasn't going up to the bathroom. I just wanted to find an empty campsite or somewhere to sit on a picnic table to make my call. There was plenty of those since this whole side of the campground where I was heading was vacant. There were no other campers nearby in that area. It was quiet and dark. So I chose the campsite. I sit down at the table. The lights from the distant bathroom from up on top of the hill behind me were illuminating my surroundings just a little bit. I called my friend and was carrying on a conversation for around 20 minutes. As I'm sitting there, staring straight ahead, I see a silhouette coming down the road in front of me. The figure is coming toward my direction, where all these empty campsites are. I could see it was a person. It's not that unusual to see people strolling through the campground for a nightly walk. The people I see usually have flashlights, though. This person did not. I wasn't creeped out at this point. No reason to be. I was just watching curiously. 
As the person got closer, I could see a better outline and that it was a man I was looking at. I also noticed his pace slowed down. I kept my eyes fixated on him as I continued conversing on my cell phone. A minute or two passes, and now he stopped moving. He's just standing there in the road, looking straight into the campsite where I am at. I don't know if he knew I could see him. He was staring at me, and I was staring right back at him. He was a little heavyset and tall. I could also make out that he was wearing a white jacket. I couldn't see much for facial features, but I would guess I was staring at a man in his 30s, maybe 40s. Alarm bells were going off in my head now. My mind had turned to mush at this point. I'm frozen, and I was no longer listening to what my friend was saying on the phone. I was in a stare-off with this guy. Then he started to move again. He was tiptoeing towards me, very carefully, like he didn't want to make noise. He put one foot in front of the other, leaned forward in a slight hunch form. It looked like he was about to charge towards me or something. In that moment, I snapped out of that mind mushy frozen state and leaped off the picnic table and started running through the campsite back towards the trail. Thud, thud, thud. I could hear him trampling behind me. Leaves scuffling, heavy yet fast footsteps. Footsteps were getting louder and closer and louder and closer. I made it back to that narrow trail. Once he got close to where I was, I heard the sound of twigs snapping and a woof noise that came from the man, which I can imagine maybe he tripped or almost tripped, or maybe got face slapped by a tree branch. Most likely he wasn't familiar with the trail like I was. Whatever the reason was, it caused him to stop chasing after me. I didn't stop to look back. I just kept running, running, and running until I made it back to my family's campsite. When I got back, they were still sharing laughs and smiles by the campfire. I broke down crying, and I was trembling. I explained what had just happened. My aunt spoke up and said, Oh, oh geez. He probably thought he knew you and was coming up to give you a good scare as a joke. She dismissed me. My cousin chimed in and said, Yeah, he probably stopped running after he realized that he didn't actually know you. He probably feels dumb now. They all chuckle about it and changed the subject. I think I was dismissed because no one wanted the good vibes of the night to be ruined and the fact that I'm just a socially anxious person in general. I'm very cautious and shy. For that time being, I let them convince me that I was just overreacting and overthinking. But here I am, years later, looking back and shaking my head over this. I wish I had taken seriously, but other than that one thing happening, it was still a great trip. It was time well spent with family. My experience makes me think twice about going for a walk by myself anywhere. I carry pepper spray and a mini keychain alarm on me now. So, Mr. Campground Chaser, you need some help and I hope we never meet again. Oh, I'd like to add, my speculation was the man may not have been a camper there. It would be easy for anyone to sneak into the campground from the boat launch area. That's just my two cents. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true camping horror stories. I'd like to take just a moment and give a very special shout-out to the Reformed members of Back to Ashes. 
Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Me, Coat Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Batty's Niece. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes. From the depths of my soul, I am forever humbled and grateful. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.